Are you as passionate about local governance and municipal issues as I am? Well, then the Cross Border Interviews is your show. We are here to provide you with exclusive insights and thought provoking conversations focusing on municipal matters from across Canada. And now, you have the chance to be part of our incredible journey. By backing our show for as little as $3 per month, you can help us grow and bring more exciting content to your ears. Now, you might be asking yourself, what sets the cross-border interviews apart from other shows? Well, we're not your average show. We dive deep into the unique challenges, successes, and innovative solutions of municipalities from across Canada. We bring you unbiased, unfiltered conversations about municipal issues from coast to coast to coast. By supporting our show, you become an essential part of our mission to amplify the voices of local leaders and shed light on the issues that matter most to our communities. Together, we can foster meaningful change and create stronger, more vibrant communities within our great country. Simply visit our website at crossborderinterviews.ca and show your support today. No matter how small, your contribution makes a significant difference and allows us to continue producing great shows, like the one you're about to hear. Together, let's make municipal issues matter again. Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all across Canada. Over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, today we are honored to be to welcome to the show from the town of Milton, Ontario, Regional Councillor Colin Best. Councillor Best is also the president of the Association of Municipalities of Ontario. Had to make sure I got that title right because I kept on screwing it up in my practice runs. Uh, Colin, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Glad to be here. So, Colin, I want to start with the big question. It's the question I've asked every single person who's ever come on this show, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Uh, my parents. Uh, they uh, both uh, were very involved in our communities. Uh, my mother is a 50-year volunteer at the uh, Milton Hospital Auxiliary, and I got voluntold from a young age to, to get involved. It was a question of you know helping out or not eating. My father was uh, very involved right from day one as a school board trustee, local councillor, and a mayor. So I've got that as well as my grandfather in England uh, was an alderman in his local community for over 15 years. So it's almost like being a farmer. So it sounds like municipal politics runs in your blood. And I'm going to so, ask the I'm going to ask the stereotypical question that every kid always asks himself. Well, my father and mother went into it. I'm going to go as far away as possible from doing what they did. What yeah. brought Colin Best to be like his father and his grandfather and run for municipal politics? Well, I was very involved in the community. I'm, I've been involved with the service clubs, uh, thanks to the Milton Rotary Club, JC's Optimist Club, and various other ones. And it's always been a sense of duty and, and basically giving back to the community, as well as you know continuing my private career. Because most, as you probably noted, most uh, local municipalities and councillors and even mayors are still full-time workers. And my previous uh, uh, AMO president, Jamie McGarvey, is the mayor of Perry Sound, but he also works full time. So a lot of small communities, you've got both. So you're, you're not devoid like you find the provincial and federal level where you're, you know, basically just leave town and don't have that connection. We always have that connection. And, and I get yelled at at least once a week. Is, do you take it to heart, though, when you get yelled at? No, it's basically you, you can tell how frustrated people are. And I get my phone calls. And uh, unlike uh, some uh, you know big city mayors and uh, councillors, uh, most uh, lo small town and local ones, you know, when you call the number, that's my home number. And a lot of other councillors. And I've had phone calls anywhere from quarter to six in the morning for uh, a parking ticket to 2.30 in the morning, uh, people telling me that, oh, the ice storms knocked out my power. And that was in 2013 when we had a major ice storm throughout uh, Ontario. 
So you find out you know, the pulse of the community very quickly. I, I, I always say whenever I ask this next question, I, I feel like I should give money to Scott Pierce, president of FCM, because I'm taking a quote of his and using it for my own. But Local governance, municipal governance is, as he said, the government of proximity. You are the closest to the people and you get to know your people and your residents quite well. In your time, as you've seen in your elected career, your community grow, in yourself grow as president of uh, AMO, has the role of councillor, has the role of municipal governance changed in the time that you've been first elected to now? Or is it still the same? It's still the same because you're not only as a, a political counselor, you're basically a service agent. And actually, one person thought I, I was as a actually a counselor, as in terms of a social counselor. I said, no, we're not really that. But you know, you're expected to you know lead not only a decision maker but also by example in your community, no matter how large or how small it is. Because the reason I ask that is, I'm assuming when you and I know you should never assume, but I'm going to assume when you got elected, you you were you had a pulse on your community. You knew what your community wanted. But as I talk to municipal leaders, particularly in Ontario, the the line of jurisdiction that the councillors and mayors are dealing with, whether it be provincial or even sometimes federal issues that the municipality is dealing with has changed a lot from when they first were elected to now. Have you noticed that or is it still the same? It's just more prominent with the rise of social media. Yeah, it's a combination and also the lack of civics education. And I, I'm in, you know, I'm in close touch with my MP, MPP, regional chair and mayor. And we get questions from people it's like, didn't you learn this in school? Like I've actually, my MP has got uh, speeding complaints on one of my rural roads. So like, why would you approach a federal MP about speeding? And likewise, I've had uh, uh, people ask me to help them with a HST return. Wait, what? Yeah. No. Oh yeah. And, and passport applications and signing documents and stuff. So a lot of it, and that's one thing where we're doing at AMO is, is uh, our next big project is called the Healthy Democracies of not only teaching people to vote, but also learning to get involved and getting informed of what uh, the functions of municipal government are and what they aren't. You know, I, I get uh, questions all the time about things that are totally out, outside our jurisdiction. Do you think it's because there's an apathetic nature towards municipal governance? And I, I say that with respect because it's not the partisanship that you see on social media and on in the news where what's happening in the House of Commons or even at Queen's Park is being displayed on the five o'clock news or in the social media networks because what's happening in municipalities isn't being told and i and i know this is not the conversation i wanted to start with but i'm going down this path because i feel like you're ready for it colin yeah well on that issue actually if you watch or follow an mp or mpp or whatever municipal or a member of legislative assemblies most of their work is in collaboration through the committee work, through constituency work. What you see on the news is just the dramatic. And unfortunately, news media focuses on what's dramatic. And I'll just give you an example. I just came from a three-hour council meeting, which will get absolutely no media coverage, I mean, even though we approved a strategic plan, various other you know, bylaws, and a lot of important stuff. But a lot of people, you know, aren't aware of it. And, it, and it's, it's uh, the uh, one uh, <clears throat> minister once said, it's not sexy. So uh, <clears throat> we, we have to be educate people what's important. And we have a number of issues, not only in my municipality, but throughout the, you know, the, the Ontario and the, and the whole Canada it is balancing the, the needs and wants. As my mayor always says, that, you know, there's a lot of things you, you want to have, but you can only afford, you know, so many things. How do you balance that? How do you balance the needs and wants of a community? Because... I can imagine, as particularly elected officials, you want to help as many people as possible. But at the end of the day, you know and I know that there's not enough money to go around to help every single person with their funding. So it, as much as I want to ask, is it hard to say no? Is it hard to not please everyone, particularly in a job where you rely on trying to please everyone to get reelected? Yeah, well, the difficult choice is is trying to find that balance. And, and as one a counselor once said to me, is like being a counselor is like walking a tightrope with blindfold and being pulled in like five directions at the same time. What we have to do balance is what we can afford to do. And that's what, you know, as my mayor always says, you know, is that uh, you, you want to have things. It's nice to have them, but 
can we afford to have them? And as I have the same mentality is you look at our budgets and say, okay, try and keep it at inflation or less and be as effective and efficient as possible. Because if you aren't, because basic municipalities, we're a service organization. We have 60% of the assets you know, throughout Canada of government agencies, but we only have 9% of the revenue. And that's where, you know, we were always advocating to the province and the federal government. I also, as my role as president of AMO, I sit on the Federation of Canadian Municipalities Board, and we face the same problem with the federal government. As you, you know, say all these nice things, but to try and get the applications through, and what we need is not what we're getting. And that's one thing we, we keep advocating, both the province and the federal government, is we need a balance. And as Scott Pierce mentioned, we need to, and Carol Asab, the executive director of FCM, is highlighting, we need to rejig this. The, the, the whole constitution of, of municipalities is 1849. We have a whole range of services. Actually, one of the uh, instructors I had it uh, for you know, counselors figures, and depending on the municipality, you have between 60 to 90 functions. This property tax system is not set up to do that. Okay, we're going to jump into this big conversation now because I feel like I need to because this is the big crux of what we're going to talk about. The fiscal framework. And I was going to talk about Milton for a bit because that's the town that you represent, but I want to talk about municipalities in general. What's the big issue facing municipalities in Ontario right now? And I know you're going to say fiscal framework and the fiscal ideas of what how how municipalities are funded. But what's the solution? What is AMO looking for from the province today to say, let's rectify this? Or is there another issue that's bigger than the fiscal framework? Well, it's a combination. We all have physical ch challenges. But the main thing I'm looking for is find a balance between economic growth and environmental concerns, you know, uh, both the, the financial side of it, but also the employment side. We have a lot of challenges in demographics. We have neighborhoods that are growing by fantastic bounds, such as some areas of Milton, but we have other communities that are actually declining in population. I was just in Northern Ontario last month, and some of those uh, areas have actually declined over the last 40 years. So you have to try and find, okay, where's something that's not only st stable, but also sustainable? Because for a lot of small communities, they've actually been declining over the years, but their costs have been going up. How do you balance, how does AMO balance the smaller communities with the larger communities? Because you're an organization that has many member, members that has many different sizes, whether it be a town, city, even a small village. And I've talked to a few of them. How do you balance when you go to the provincial government saying we need a better funding uh, revenue or uh, uh, stream, but we need one and a better uh, process to make sure that all of our members are getting ahead, not just these cities where the big population booms are going on, but the smaller communities that are struggling even worse right now. Yeah, well, we do a number of efforts, most of it through delegations to provincial cabinet ministers and also highlighting to them that not one size doesn't fit all. What works in Kapuskasing doesn't work in Canada or in Toronto. And we represent almost all the 444 municipalities, and they range from anywhere from 500 people up to over a million for Ottawa. And one thing that we have to do is, you know, say to them, and we try to do that monthly or what's called MOU or Memorandum of Understanding Meetings, is here's some of the issues. And we have seven caucuses and representing everything from northern, small urban, large urban counties and regions and saying, OK, we've got different needs here. Could you find ways of doing it? And to their uh, you know, appreciation uh, of a number of members, they have funding for communities less than 100,000, which is more than half our membership. So they've done that, as well as the gasoline tax, which we have through the federal uh, and provincial bodies. You know, we can do both. It's a question of what's appropriate, and that's the difficult. Like we all, you know, we have in our own lives. You know, your own personal budget. You know, there's things you like to do, what you can afford to do, are two different things. What happens if the fiscal framework doesn't change? Because you and I both know that the province and the federal government. Take their time. And I'm being very sympathetic there by saying take their time um, on changing uh, anything when it comes to funding agreements. So this is not going to happen tomorrow. It's not going to happen this year. It might not even happen for five years, hypothetically. What happens in the municipalities in Ontario today, tomorrow, next year, that needs to sort of refocus their financial situations to ensure the longevity of their communities? 
Well, one of the most important points we just had this spring is when the uh, treasurer, uh, Minister Bethenthal, you know, announced two hundred and two million dollars for mental health uh, and addiction assistance, as well as homelessness, over four hundred million, as well as an increase, which really helps a lot of communities because homelessness is an issue in every community, no matter how large or small, and it's getting quite visible in a number of communities, even my own community, and we have to change that. Where basically, you know. Property tax was not meant to do this type of thing. This is a provincial and federal service, and we need because a lot of people are hurting out there, a lot of both mentally and, and through addictions. And we need to have to change that because so we've seen a lot of, of and you see it in Toronto all the time, where people are homeless out in the street, and, and it's, it's becoming visible in a lot of communities. The role of the municipality, as we said earlier on, has changed a lot over the last 10 years, particularly when it comes to downloading. I want to stick on this mental health and addiction part for, for a second here, because mm-hmm. your municipalities are being asked to do more with less money and do more with provincial juris in the provincial jurisdictions, particularly mental health and addictions. What programs are is AMO looking at to set up or even have they set up to sort of help alleviate some of the growing pains that municipalities have to go through to sort of get up and running when it comes to servicing the mental health and addiction community or mental health and addiction thing uh, 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 problems that they're facing? Well, that's one thing we've asked the province and the federal government is to come to our assistance. We also have an issue of refugees. So anybody are they here? willing to come? Because fiscal oh, framework well, set aside. Okay, yeah. that's something we talk about. But mental health seems like something that they'd want to come to the table and help out with because they yeah. know a better community for uh, you guys is a better community for Ontario. Yeah, it's a multifaceted issue because we have a lot of people that are not only have those issues, but are also homeless. And you just have to look at the affordability. We just had the uh, uh, interest rate go up another quarter point today, which is making it even more unaffordable for people. So that, that's one thing that we've been asking and we've been receiving some uh, positive feedback. And we work very closely with cabinet ministers and because they're seeing their communities, they're hearing it as well. So we basically have to work together. And, you know, we may have some policy differences, but, you know, a lot of times, you know, we got to say, okay, we got to balance this. We can't have people sleeping on the street. You can't, but the cost of living is going through the roof and housing is a big priority, not only for municipalities, but for the province as well. And affordability is one of these issues that we talk about a lot because mental health and addictions goes hand in hand with housing. With housing, you get people off the street, you get the resources that they need. Housing is a big thing that a lot of people are struggling with right now in your role as president, even in your role as regional counselor, are municipalities trying their best to get the housing crisis under uh, control, realizing that you're only one pawn in the chessboard that needs to work together to save this big issue that's going on, not only in Ontario, but across Canada? Yeah, that's what we're trying to do. And we've asked the province to do the same is using whatever lands that we have to build housing. We just approved today at Regional Council a 12-unit affordable uh, uh, rental apartments in Georgetown. I've got in my own community uh, 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 the uh, what's called the Allendale uh, Long-Term uh, Campus, which has almost 20 acres or 8 hectares of land. We've got a, a campus plan for almost 1,000 units of assisted housing. We just need the province and the federal government to come to the table at the same time, because that's the problem when you have three levels of government is bringing everybody together and just saying, OK, you know, this is something you both say. And as my mayor always says, if you say you pay, well, if you're saying we need to build more housing, we need the province to come to the table and help out because a lot of it is in the affordable sector, because a lot of people, you know, their wages haven't gone up and they can't afford you know, multi-digit increases. While you have to get all three of the levels of government to the table, you also have to get people who want to build in your communities. And we know that every municipality is trying to sort of incentivize other uh, builders to come to their communities to build in their community, but also build affordable housing. Because right now there's a big push for a certain type of housing and you need the diversity of housing to sort of help with that affordability issue. How does AMO and how does uh, other municipalities across your province look at 
working in partnership and collaboration with the building industry as well, because they're a piece of the puzzle that a lot of people often forget about because they think it's just a federal and take down the red tape and take down the, and yeah. I hate to use politicians' words, but gatekeepers, but it's the builders who also need to actually build the houses that people will live in. It's not just the municipalities approving the housing units. Yeah, well, I've talked to builders almost every week, and we just had a another uh, report on regional council today about streamlining, and then thanks to some assistance we have from the province, is basically reducing the time because you know we've seen actually the city of Toronto takes up to three years to get a rezoning. In my community, the average is about seven to nine months. So it's basically working out that area. But unfortunately, builders also have the other challenges. You know, they have increased challenges with financing, not only get to get, you know, an affordable interest rate, but also even to get a, 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 an application. Because to give you an idea, you're looking at minimum half a million dollars per unit. Uh, secondly, construction costs are going through the roof. And third, we have a labor shortage now of skilled to, of uh, tradespeople because most of them are in the 58 to 65 year old age. The baby boomers are retiring, and there's not a people you know, that's part of our, our challenge with the education system that uh, trades are a very good uh, position to be in. You got a lifetime of employment. I've known the builders all my life, and it's a great career. You just have to make sure you have the skills for it because, you know, the technology involved with building a house is just incredible these days. What can municipalities do on the at the local level to help alleviate some of these concerns as well? Because advocating to the provincial government for uh, better education on what areas of uh jobs you can go into after high school is one way, but what should municipalities and what are you saying to municipalities who ask you this question, what can we do now to sort of help bring people to our community, but also help work hand in hand with those builders to make sure that we get those uh, housing, uh, housing units uh, built? Yeah, well, one thing that uh, most municipalities are doing, especially in the GTA, is designating mobility hubs, <clears throat> or TMSAs which is basically finding an area where you could put high density and encouraging builders to build there. And that's one thing that my community, as well as uh, Burlington and Oakville and Holland Hills are doing. They've actually designated an area for mixed use housing, which you have not only the, the places for people to live in affordable housing, but also employment areas as well as retail. And that's one thing we've got around our GO station where currently there's about 600 people, but in 20 years time, we could have 20,000. You you sit on a regional councillor for a regional council for those who may not know who are listening to this outside of Ontario as someone who's from Ontario who lived in Durham region so I know the regional councillor system quite well. Um, I you you sit on two different councils you sit on the town of Milton's council but also the the region of Halton if I'm not mistaken if yes. I'm correct yeah. And in that role, there's a lot of collaboration that is done in your community uh, fire services EMS so there's police services. Are you seeing more municipalities moving to the regional approach? I know we can talk about what's going on in Peel, what's going on in York later on, but that's not what we're talking about today. But are more municipalities working in collaborations with their neighbors more now than ever because of the fiscal framework, because of the housing issues, because of X, Y, and Z? Or are you still seeing a one, we're in it by ourselves. And I know AMO is there to work together, but regionally, are you seeing more people trying to work regionally? Yeah, we've always had that. And for people outside of Ontario, Ontario's always had what's called a two-tier system, whether it be counties, towns, and townships, or a region and a, and a local municipality. And we just have to look at our, our fire services. <clears throat> and most of them, you know, not only in Ontario, but other provinces, where we have what's system called mutual aid. And it's the same with our public utilities commissions or hydros, where if there is a problem in one area, you have an agreement to, to come and help each other out. Same with our public works. Give you an idea where all our regional roads are taken care of by the local snowplows. So you don't have to have two different uh, plows going similar routes. So I'm seeing you know more use of this because a lot of municipalities, like such as in Muskoka, used to have a number of municipalities and they downsized into one large community. And that's one thing that you know they've worked out. So Sud Greater Sudbury is, is another example. But you know, as you know, as so what the old saying goes, big is not always beautiful, because uh, you know it, it, it's it, you know you look at you know some things issues in, in Toronto and Hamilton 
where they thought, oh, amalgamation is going to make it more efficient. It didn't. And we have to look at is how effective are you? And that's one thing that it takes a lot of collaboration and also people willing to work together. You just said the most dirtiest word in municipal politics, amalgamation. I'm very shocked that a municipal councillor is willing to say that word just so off the cuff. <laughs> but it it is what it is, because I, I know a lot amalgamation People don't want to lose their identity, and I, I get that in the municipal realm, but sometimes it is needed, and that's just my own personal opinion there. Yeah. Um, I, I want to turn to the future now because I am very cautious of time, and I want to get this part in here. What does the future of municipalities in Ontario look like? <laughs> you're, yeah, you've got a crystal ball. Good luck because uh, nobody knows. Uh, but you're the president and you you are leading the organization through the next year because by the time this airs, you're coming up on your one year anniversary of being selected as president of AMO. For you, what do you see the future of municipalities look like? Well, what I'm seeing is basically working together and whether you work together as you know amalgamated communities or as separate ones. And give you an idea, we I know of uh, three counties that share the same building inspector. And they all basically pool their costs, and this is just outside London. And other ways, basically being as effective and efficient as possible, I could see you know there is going to be some change, especially in the regional governments. The minister, uh, Steve Clark, has you know stated that there'll be some facilitators. I'm looking forward to it because most regions have been around for 50 years. We haven't had too much uh, change in them. <clears throat> We're re recommending some minor changes. Uh, some other regions may have some major changes. So you're going to see a mix of, of things because the last time we had this major must change was back in the 1970s with Bill Davis and Darcy McHugh. Oh, Bill. So we're looking at you know a lot of changes. I don't know what the future is going to hold because it all depends on the economy. If the economy still keeps the same, we're going to be doing good. If the economy turns south, we could be in trouble. So we have to work together. And I'm looking at, at working in a number of areas, no matter it's a, lot of, it's a large community or a small community, of saying, okay, how can we do this better? Because <clears throat> as you mentioned, a lot of these uh, challenges, such as mental health, addiction, homelessness, is affecting everyone. And we have to you know, find a way of doing it. We don't know what the answer is, but it's coming. Growth is a big thing that's going to be on the radar for a lot of municipalities. But the issue is, and I think uh, uh, there's a few municipalities that I've spoken to, that there's no space to grow anymore because they've hit their limit. There's They can start uh, buying uh, pieces of lands from other municipalities. And re I, I see the shaking of the head for those who are listening to this. But you have to go up. And there's a lot of nimbyism that is alive and well in this country. And I not I don't just say that in uh, Ontario, but nimbyism is alive. There's a lot of people who just don't want to see the growth that uh, municipalities need to survive, but also to adapt to the pressures that the fiscal framework that they currently have is put into place. How do municipalities in the next few years battle back against the nimbyism that's alive and well in uh, in Ontario and in Canada? Well, it's a question of you know what's appropriate. And what I always say when we have a rezoning application, is this going to benefit the community or be a burden? You know, some applications I've supported, you know, because they are a benefit. They basically bring, you know, activity and things. One point about that you mentioned there is the demographic change. A lot of the baby boomers are retiring. They're looking to downsize. They want to downsize uh, to a smaller community where they actually have bungalows and, and uh, attached uh, homes or what's called multi-use buildings <clears throat> where they can actually just take an elevator. They don't need a car. But the other point is we're seeing in mature neighborhoods of Mississauga, Oakville, and Burlington, and actually Hamilton, where there's actually population decrease because instead of a family of uh, three or four people, you only have one person living in that house. So in the next 10 to 20 years, a lot of those homes, and I found it actually on one street in Milton when I was campaigning, a gentleman pointed out, you see those children there? It's the first children we've had in the street in 20 years. So a lot of that change is going to come within existing homes. And give you an idea, in my own the first quarter of, uh, of this year, 20% of the building permits in Milton were for secondary apartments. You're going to find a lot of existing homes in these neighborhoods having a secondary apartment or a basement apartment or what we call a granny suite because you're, I'm finding more and not only my ward, but other wards, a multi-generational family. So we have grandparents, parents, and children, and they all help each other out. 
want to talk about Milton here for a second because I want I want to focus on that because that's why I originally brought you on. But we went on a tangent on municipalities in Ontario, and I love that because this is the way my show works. If anyone else wants to create a show, they can. I want to talk about Milton, and I want to ask the stupid question, but it's the important question because I'm pretty sure I already know what the question answer is going to be because you've already answered about four times. Um, what do you see, in your opinion, because I'm asking this as a regional counselor to a show host. This is not a direction of counsel for those who are listening who are about to send me a very nasty email. This is not a motion of counsel. This is the regional counselor's opinion. Mm -hmm. Call it, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue or issues facing the town of Milton today as of recording this episode? Well, first one is balancing the growth, which the province's mandate is, with the services, whether they be local, regional, provincial or federal. <clears throat> we have a real need for more schools, hospital expansion, and metro links. That's just one issue of itself. We could spend a whole three hours on that. Second big issue is, especially in my ward in the rural area, if you look at the map behind me, I represent Ward 1, which is almost three quarters of the town. Most of it does not have high-speed internet, which is a problem throughout you know, the Ontario and Canada, which FCM and AMO both taken positions on that, you know, basically you have dial up service. So if you're trying to conduct business or even farm or, you know, do your homework, you can't get on the internet, you know, for a sufficient amount of time. A uh, third issue that I talked to you previously is the CN rail intermodal, which they just blocked off last week, a local road with no consultation. They just basically did that and we're going to court on that. And that's an issue that I've brought forward to, you know, both provincially and federally, that if railways could do this to us, they could do it to anybody throughout the, the, the whole of the country. And this is where we actually have a constitutional challenge saying that, you know, if you're a railway, you should also work with the municipalities, not just the federal government, because they've basically stated in court that they don't have to apply by any municipal or provincial law, which we think is wrong. Well, I want to stick on that because I know it is something that uh, you and I have emailed back and forth on for a bit. And I want to I ask the stupid question here. But what were they thinking? Like, why would they not just even approach the town and say, this is what we're doing. We're closing off a street here because we need something or the reason why. Have you has the town even like gotten anything from CN about why they've done what they've done? Well, it's to, to build this intermodal yard, <clears throat> which as the mayor stated publicly, you know, they did make some, you know, basically just informed us, but it's basically take it or leave it. We're doing this anyway, which I disagree with. <clears throat> and it's one thing we have three court challenges on the environmental, constitutional, and legal framework we have because railways, you know, when the country, uh, country was founded, you know, they, they had special provisions to build wherever they wanted. Now we have built up urban areas where they're trying to put a basically a, a mobile warehouse in the middle of a residential area. We, we basically this proposal violates their own uh, policies. It's within 400 meters of residential area, which they knew was already there before they bought the land. And their own policies state that it should be at least a kilometer away. And that's a concern we have not only here, but other municipalities have throughout the uh, the whole country. So that road that they did close down, is it a major road in the town? Like, is it a well-accessed road that people use on a regular basis? And yeah. you talked about earlier on, like in our, my, probably the first, second question that you get a call at two o'clock in the morning or six o'clock in the morning about random things. I can imagine when this happened, your phone blew up about what was going on and the, this road or that this road had now yep. been closed without any consultation to the yep. general public, because I know municipalities want to consult and want to give the information out. And if they don't have the information, it looks bad on them. Yeah. Well, we've actually posted signs saying this closure is illegal and highlighted up. And I had people wanting, Oh, can we do a protest here? Well, we're already doing it in court. And that <clears throat> that's basically the route we have to take. Because uh, you know, this is something that not only CM, but other railway companies have done this. We have a similar issue with the city of Sarnia with Drainage Act, where railways are not applying with the provincial Drainage Act, where basically they have they have responsibilities. They're not doing it. And we also have similar ones throughout the country with grade crossings. So there's a lot of issues here. And we're hoping to uh, work out you know things because you know railways are, are a source of transportation, but they also have to work with the communities that they're in. 
Have you heard anything from the federal minister of transportation or even the provincial minister of transportation on this issue? Not yet. It's only been a week. Uh, anyway, federal politics, the move at the pace of a train sometimes. Bad joke. I apologize. The trains are faster. Yeah, they're true. I'll, I want to go to the last segment because I'm cautious of time and I know you are a busy man. And I want to talk about tourism because it's a one thing that I love. I love visiting communities. And I have said to one of your council colleagues that if you come on my show, I'm coming to your community and I'm going to be in Milton in August of this year. So I'm looking forward to potentially sitting down with you for a coffee or potentially seeing some of these sites that you're about to mention. In your opinion, what are some of the hidden gems in Milton or the surrounding area that I need to visit when I'm in your community this next month? Okay, well, Chris, uh, you just look at uh, yesterday's uh, Globe Mail or Toronto Star to see the front page uh, article regarding Crawford Lake. It's a Miramictic uh, lake that's in my ward off a of Guelph line. And it's something that's part of our conservation area. And it's now been just designated internationally as one of the few markers which highlights the different eras because anything that goes into the lake actually stays in the lake, goes straight down. It, does, it doesn't run off anywhere. So that's one. It's very interesting. It also is at Iroquois Village there, a recreation, because they actually found you know, the, the hut, where the huts were at the time. So that's one of the major attractions. We have Country Heritage Park, which is formerly the Ontario Agriculture Museum. It's 85 acres right on the 401, which has a wealth of uh, programs and uh, information. And also you can see what life was like you know, 100 years ago plus. Plus they have a full livestock operation going on there. We also have the Radio Railway Museum on Guelph Line, just north of Milton, which if you want to have a, a train ride through a forest and actually ride on any type of streetcar you've was ever invented, and we have a wealth of other museums and attractions. We have Kelso Conservation Area, Rattlesnake Point, and various other conservation areas, which, you know, thousands of people, we actually had a million people last year come out to our conservation areas because we're so close to Toronto. And we also have, you know, our mill pond, which helped create the town, which was actually hand dug back in the 1830s, which has a walking trail around it. So, and also we have one of the most unique town halls, it's actually a former courthouse in jail. It looks like a castle. And actually, our mayor's been, uh, you know, say that, oh, you work you, you work in a castle. And this is by a little boy that we saw in there. I was like, wow, you know, because it's one of the unique uh, designs. And also, we have a lot of history here, which uh, we're very proud of. So uh, a lot, we could keep you up for a whole week if you want to. Hey, I'm going to be there for a few days, so I'll certainly make sure I do that. But what makes it so unique? What makes the town of Milton such a unique place to live, work, and raise a family? And I hate well, to ask that question because everyone's like, that's the stereotypical question, but I like asking it. So why do you think Milton's the greatest place to live, work, and raise a family? Well, we, we have the Niagara Escarpment, which if you're driving the 401, is probably the most unique feature, you know, and, and goes right through my ward, as you can see on the map behind me. We're also close enough to take the benefits of the city of Toronto and Mississauga, but we're far enough away that you have peace and quiet and you don't have the hustle and bustle of those uh, communities. And it's a great place to raise a family. We've had thousands of people move here over the last 20 years. And we're now on to another generation that are basically very proud to, you know, to live and work here. And also we've got people saying, okay, this is you know just where I want to be. It's a mix of, of rural and urban. So you're not just you know, in a big mass, because that's one of the issues I had from other people from other municipalities. It's just like, you know, it's urban area from one end to the other. And actually, one lady once uh, said to me, I like to come back to Milton because you can see cows on the way home. That's awesome. I want to end on this question, though, because I, I, in your capacity as president of AMO, and I want to know, you are one year into your two-year term as president. Looking back on the last year, looking forward over the next year, what do you hope to get accomplished and what do you feel like you've accomplished in your first year? Well, raising to the... Uh, provincial government, you know, some of the effects of some of the bills they have, such as Bill 23, which downloaded a lot of costs to municipalities. The minister, Rusty Clark, has said he's going to make us whole. I'm looking forward to the details of that. Also, you know, going through an election, we had actually the uh, uh, October election, we had 42% of councillors and mayors elected brand new. 
So we're going to have quite a turnover. And I'm looking forward to our conference in August in London. And just highlighting, we have a new generation. Actually, we have three new councillors on our uh, council. And actually, I've been to some municipalities. Half the council was our new people were elected, including the mayor. So we're seeing a lot of change here. I'm looking forward to balancing our growth that the province has told us in their, in their housing pledges with the infrastructure we need, both provincially and federally, because we have to be, work together on this. And I'm certainly willing to do, you know, step out because we've signed our pledge. We've also told the province we need hospital expansions. We need schools on a timely manner. And we also need transportation because if we don't have that. What's the point? Okay, I know I said that was my last question, but I have eight minutes and you just mentioned something I need to ask you because you were president and you just brought it up. Yes, there was a big turnover in the last municipal election. A lot of new councillors, mayors elected. But we are seeing a stagnant, uh, not a stagnant, a staggering uh, issue that's happening across Canada where people are not getting involved municipally anymore. And they're not running municipally. You look at the last Ontario election, there was a lot, and I mean a lot of acclamations. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm not saying that's a good thing. I'm just saying it's a very worrying sign that people are not getting involved municipally. And I know that you just talked about earlier on about the uh, program that AMO is running. How do you get people excited about municipal governance? (laughs) And I'm not trying to be rude there because... I think I found a niche talking about municipal politics, but it's still something that people don't think about on a regular basis. But when your water doesn't turn on, your garbage doesn't get picked up, I guarantee you, you will hear about it. When the passport office is closed, might take a week to find out. How do you make municipal politics where something that people want to get involved in and something that people want to do? Well, it's one thing I I tell you, I was, Praiser for 30 years, and I note to people that you may be able to change your house, but you can't change the neighborhood or your community. So you better get involved because if you don't get involved, you could end up with, with infrastructure issues, you could have growth problems that major issues where you have traffic and, and other things happening in the area. So we're encouraging through our healthy democracies, not only to be informed, but also involved. You don't have to be an elected person. Actually, some of my best community leaders have never been elected. They have no desire to be elected, but they have more input than most politicians have. So I encourage people to do that at our conference and actually encourage people to go to our website, amo.on.ca and just see the different issues that we deal with because the average, you know, and people don't realize this, the average municipal government deals with 60 to 90 issues every week. And that's one thing you don't see with the federal or provincial level because we affect you as you highlight. And I've, I've used the same example. You, If the municipality collapses, you find out in three seconds, but guess what? Your local hydro is delivered by your municipality. You know, through your hydro or PUC, and the same with your water, your sewers, and your roads. So, you know, it's your home. You should take an investment because you look at the, the average value of homes in my area is over a million dollars there. You think if it, your your bank manager called you, well, I've got a million dollar investment here. Do you think you w- would uh, answer the call? And we're asking people to answer the call and get involved and make it because it's your future. It's your ch- kid's future and your grandchildren's future. So the link to the AMO website will be in the show notes for anyone who do wants to, who wants to check that out. I highly recommend it. Um, Colin, I want to thank you so much. And I say this all the time, but I say this with sincerity each time I say it. Thank you for serving. I don't think municipal councillors get enough thank yous. And I want to thank you for serving your community, serving as president of AMO, but also taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down with me for almost 45 minutes, almost close to an hour, and talking about municipal issues. I feel like we've just scratched the surface. And when I'm in Milton later on this year, literally next month, hopefully we can go grab a coffee and we can continue this conversation. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Chris, and I look forward to take, giving a tour. Um, so with that, I want to remind everyone, put down your cell phone. Go have a conversation with somebody for at least five minutes a day. It helps our society, helps our democracy, and helps us be better people. So with that, this will be the Crossboard Interviews. Until next time, just keep talking.